without further ado, we'll bring up Juan Bennett, uh, founder of Protocol Labs. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yep. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you for coming so early. Uh, Stanford always making me roll out early in the morning. Um, how many people are here from uh, Stanford, just so I get a sense of the distribution? Very few. This is awesome. This is great. This is like the first Stanford event I go to. The, the distribution is like actually more broader. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, insular communities um, sometimes get disconnected from the real world. Uh, great. How many people here work uh, at a startup in crypto? About half. How many people are like thinking about getting into crypto but are not yet in crypto? Cool. How many people are like builders? Okay, awesome. How many people are like, um, what are the other people? Like investors? Some amounts? Uh, what are, okay, wow, that's like a half. Cool, actually, I have good stuff for you. Um, <laughs> not things to invest in, but how about how capital is gonna change? Um, and how many people here are like trying to look at the next like two to five years of like what's coming versus say like the next 10 years? So who is more interested in the next five years? Half, who's more interested in the next 10, 15 years? Cool, that's great, I'm glad. Uh, you should be thinking long term. Uh, great, so uh, let me see the list. Well, my guess is probably in the whole list, um, I'm one of the earliest people in crypto here. Um, I tend to be pretty early to things, uh, and so I wanna talk to you about some things that are pretty early right now. You will hear about them and you'll be like, ah, is this really gonna be that significant? Um, but that's the point, it's, uh, I'm trying to give you some like things that will matter uh, longer term, more than what you think might matter right now. Uh, this is probably not what's gonna be like super hot or whatever, but this, you might be hearing about it, it's definitely not secret or new or whatever, um, but it's what I think is going to matter much more than, than the other stuff. Uh, I'm also gonna make it highly interactive because it's early in the morning and I wanna keep you guys like awake for, uh, you know, if I just start blathering at you, uh, you're just gonna tune out, fall asleep, and so on. Uh, cool, so a bit about me. Um, I built a lot of things uh, in the crypto space. I got into um, crypto in 2012, 2013, built IPFS, built, built Filecoin, built WP, now working on a thing called IPC. Um, big part of the Ethereum community, the public goods, uh, public goods funding community. Um, worked on a ton of, um, PL is now this startup network, so it's not kind of like a single company, but it's now a network with hundreds of startups and hundreds of projects. Um, I advise a lot of companies and invest in a lot of things and so on. Um, the way that I think about it is uh, we have a, a super powerful um, set of tools in the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, we get to create incentives, which means um, you can program humanity. So don't think about the blockchain space as programming computers. Think of the blockchain space as programming humanity. And that includes organizations, people, um, nations, whatever. Like that's, that's what you get to play with. Um, which I think is you know, one of the most important things going on um, in the species right now. Uh, so a lot of people got into the space because of this. Uh, there's like a, a super problematic um, security uh, picture uh, where the digital systems that we've built over the last 20, 30 years um, can radically um, create some like really bad uh, outcomes. And so a bunch of the people that built the Web3 space from the beginning have been trying to establish a whole bunch of digital rights in the, in the, in the world, bake them into the underlying stack. Uh, and we do that by creating a whole bunch of systems. So we build large scale distributed systems, things like IPFS, things like Ethereum, things like um, NIM, uh, and so on. And through those things, we can build secure systems to give us digital rights that we can embed into, um, into the network. There's tons of people working on this. Um, of course, it's a, it's a major part of the Web3 movement. So um, I could spend a lot of time talking about this and because I said I was gonna make it highly interactive, I'm gonna move to Q&A relatively quickly. So happy to spend time talking about any of these kinds of projects, any of these kinds of things. The, you know, I, I kind of pulled a set of people coming to the event. Um, people wanted to know about ZK, people wanted to know about AI and so on. But the thing that I wanna give you the most alpha on, in a sense, in the long term, is this second thing about the blockchains that we have can help us upgrade our entire economies and our government systems, and that's way more important than the cloud stuff. The cloud stuff is really critical, and we have to kind of like finish that mission, um, and so a lot of us spend most of our time on that. I spend most of my time on that, but I wanna kind of like alert you to the fact that the, there's a major other opportunity, and you should start spending some fraction of your time on that, and you should be encouraging a lot of people to spend your time on that. And that's around kind of economies and governance systems. Um, kind of like setting our, um, Bearing straight. Uh, this is what I call the R&D pipeline. Can you see that well? Uh, kind of. Um, this is what I call the R&D pipeline. You have um, research here that's kind of like academic research funded by primarily public goods funding in terms of nation states. You have um, 
corporations building technology over here, uh, and that's primarily funded by um, like investment capital, financial capital, um, kind of like public things are over here. This is mostly kind of the realm of VC. This is kind of where startups start. Here in the middle, this section, going from basic research into things that are startup worthy, is tragically underfunded. This is where the best startups are built. So this is where your, you know, SpaceX's, Tesla's, um, Apple's, um, like the, the Google's, um, the best things are kind of like here in this environment. So for all of you investors out there, look for things here. Usually they'll look like science projects. When I went around pitching protocol labs and IPFS and Pathway to people, um, I also had to pitch like Ethereum along the way because people like didn't know what it was. So many VCs at the time were like, Ethereum is a science project, never gonna work. And I was like, man, if we're starting there, like, then probably don't want to tell you about all the other stuff that we're working on. Um, but like, that's, unfortunately, that's what it looks like. And so most of VC kind of exists here, um, where it's kind of, a, kind of obvious things are working and so on. This is where the really valuable stuff is. Um, unfortunately, most VCs can't afford to invest here because it's very expensive. Like, this is extremely, extremely expensive to do kind of like the, the, the technology translation piece. There's a, a bigger hope that I have that we can create better incentive structures to actually make this financializable. Um, there's a reasons why there's no good investment assets here. Um, usually a lot of the teams that build here are not the same people that build the startups and grow. It's very rare that you find those kind of um, startups that can go take something from early R&D all the way th through that. And so this requires a lot of, um, probably on the order of t uh, 10 to 100x more capital um, and effort to turn a science project into something that can become a startup. And so this is extremely expensive, underfunded, um, and so on. If we can find a way to financialize this, then we can um, create like very strong incentive structures that can then make everything go way faster. So look for the things in the space right now that are thinking about incentive structures to um, financialize this, this part of the pipeline. This is before there are startups. This is before there are products. So this is, these are kind of like new forms of IP, new forms of like um, grants that might turn into um, uh, some kind of investable uh, asset uh, and so on, things like hypercerts, things like um, spreading money through credit distribution graphs, so like drips and so on. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think uh, can be super valuable. Um, you know, if you're not paying attention, in the last 80 years, the world got totally transformed by computers. Um, that's accelerating. Uh, it's gonna get like way, 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 way more intense. And like the next 80 years are super crazy, right? Like the, the kinds of things that are gonna happen with BCI, AI models, AGI and so on, totally gonna rewrite how the species works. So um, get ready for that. Um, and uh, think of like, how is the world gonna start reacting to these things? We have a super deeply inadequate government systems that can't really cope with this sort of thing. <laughs> and, um, and at the same time, we also have like super inadequate economic systems, right? So like, this is the total R&D budget of the US uh, spent in kind of um, non-defense things. Uh, this yellow part, this is why we have, um, this is why we went to the moon. This is like the amount of capital spent in the Apollo program and related programs. This is why we got to the moon. This, is, this part, when Congress was like, whoa, 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 this is way too expensive. This is why we don't have the space industry today. Um, this is why we never went to Mars uh, and so on. Uh, this green one is energy. This, this part here is why we have fission. And this part here is why we don't have fusion. Um, and so this is about, um, you know, I, I kind of like always ask, how, many, how much money do you think this is? How much money do you think that US spends yearly on R&D, kind of non-defense R&D? Just any guesses? One trillion. One trillion. 12 billion. 12 billion. Oh, that's very low. Uh, more? It's actually 980 billion. Oh. Um, that's including corporations. This is just the government. So 60, you were very close, uh, 60 billion. With, for 60 billion a year, you could fund all of the R&D that the US does. Is, what's that? Um, the defense R&D is probably two to three X this, um, but a, and so a lot of it is kind of defense technology and so on. Um, the bigger problem is that this is just so small, right? So this is kind of like cures the cancer, this is like early tech like the internet, this is like, um, you know, all, all, the, all the NSF grants, like, this is what builds the future. So everybody knows that, you know, science and technology build the future. Um, if you could just do a lot more of it, then you, everything would advance faster and the world would get better and so on. And yet, most of our money does not go to that. 
This is the, how much money you needed in Fusion, according to like most of the plans that people came up with. That's how much we spend yearly on Netflix. Not just Netflix, but like the Netflix type of products. So this is abysmal, right? Like this as a species, when we look at this and we're like, how are we okay with this? This is like totally a, a, a missed, mismanaged civilization. So um, crypto gives you the tools to like get out of this trap. Um, so very quickly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, non-zero sum games. So most people, when they hear about non-zero sum games, they kind of picture something like this. If you collaborate, you know, if you compete and so on and fight, then you're going to lose out. So everyone kind of like knows that. And so sure, you should collaborate and kind of like improve your gains and so on and grow the pipe. Uh, unfortunately, that's not really how it works. It works more like this. Um, if you collaborate, you can create orders of magnitude more value. This is science, this is technology, this is like um, you know, penicillin, this is like cures to cancer. Like you create orders of magnitude more value. So like the current model of the world is not oriented towards this. It does not really truly understand how this um, affects everything we do. Uh, so this landscape of being able to kind of be in this highly collaborative environment that is non-competitive, that is trying to like go as fast as we can to kind of realize the gains, is what um, some great philosophers called Pareto, Pareto Topia, because these are Pareto improvements. The point is, how do we get there? How do we kind of coordinate the whole species to do these kinds of things? Uh, this is where crypto can help, right? So crypto economics can give you the tools to incentivize the world to be able to get there. I mentioned that this is software eating um, kind of incentive structures, mechanism design, and so on. Um, you know, this, think of Bitcoin and, and Filecoin as like, the product of two incentive structures that got released out into the world and then just assembled massive amounts of hardware and just are you know, powering these huge supercomputer clusters. Um, now, unfortunately, the Bitcoin one is like wasted, the Falcon one is useful, um, but this is like crazy powerful, right? Like a couple incentive structures with a currency, like reorganize the entire world to do this. You could do this to um, carbon capture. You could do this to increasing more solar. In fact, GLOW is a project that is working on this, to increase um, the amount of solar on the planet by just releasing a couple incentive structures into the world. Um, so this is kind of like the background of what, I'm, like, what I think is a, one of the most important things happening in the entire blockchain space, which is how do we use these incentive structures to rewrite our economies, our governments, and so on. Uh, there's a whole movement called Greenfield that you should go check out. Uh, there's a great book. There's a podcast. Highly kind of recommend you go down that rabbit hole. Um, but the core of it is like you're shaping incentive structures, you're shaping the landscape on how people are, uh, what they're choosing to do. And so think about how to use that to coordinate lots of people to get to this kind of part of the Topian outcome. And so think of blockchains not as kind of like just improving the cloud stack, which you know, a lot of us have spent a lot of time on and will continue to do so to kind of land that mission, but also think of them as a way to rewrite how all of civilization works. And you have to start small. So, you know, whenever you have some super ambitious thing, you have to break it down into small components, test it out, make it work, work, and then scale it. But this is some of the most important stuff that's happening in the entire space right now. Uh, these are things like, you know, I'll give you some, like, examples. Um, the last thing I'll kind of mention, could, because a lot of you might be like, man, this sounds, like, pretty, pretty cool, but, like, really, is this actually going to work? Crypto is just a small relative to the rest of the world. Um, so this is kind of like a total crypto market cap. Uh, you know, for the people that are like, kind of skeptical about, is crypto really going to be like, so significant? Um, this is kind of crazy, you know, huge ups and downs. Here it is in a log graph, you know, kind of like a steady pathway this entire time. Um, we're probably the only industry that uses log graphs to look at market caps. Uh, <laughs> that should tell you something about like, how weird this place is. Um, but what I think is more interesting is to look at all of the money in the world. So this is a great visualization from the, um, the visual capitalist. Uh, they make great graphs. Uh, here's crypto in 2021 top, which we're kind of like near at the, currently. Um, this is military spending. This is just currencies. This is gold. Gold. Gold's cool metal, but like, come on. Like, programmable digital incentive structures and like way more valuable than gold, right? Like, pff, like if people, think the cryptocurrency is overvalued, like just show them this graph. Um, this is, you know, central bank balance sheets, the S&P 500, there's a lot of value here, a lot of technology and so on. Um, global money supply, stock markets in general, debt. Real estate, oh man, like our house is really worth that? <laughs> like, oh man. Um, yeah, the, the weird thing is like you can't really bet on these kinds of bubbles because like, 
the world can stay irrational for centuries. Um, this is like derivatives. It just keeps going and going and going. So these are all the outstanding bets um, through you know all kinds of like Wall Street. So and people tell you that like crypto is full of scams. <laughs> Even if this was like 50% scams, which is absolutely not. Like just compare it to any of this stuff. Like this all this other stuff is full of scams. Like just this derivative stuff. Like just 0.1% of that like is much bigger than all of the scams in crypto, right? Like this this is crazy. And so. Um, you know, when people doubt crypto, just show them that graph, and then remember like, that you're building programmable economies and pro program programmable systems and so on. So, if we can create our economies, these blockchain weird things, and start orienting them towards solving large-scale problems, and routing the incentives for solving large-scale problems, as these things get more valuable, you start reaching levels of capital um, routing, that starts rivaling not corporations, but nation states. That's super crazy, right? So we're talking about potentially being able to fund what the US does out of blockchains. Like imagine a world where blockchains suddenly outperform the US in funding R&D. Like that's possible. That's possible within like 10, five, 10 years is like the optimistic case, probably more like 15 to 20, but th this could be tremendously significant. And you can do that by just taking a, a blockchain network and dedicating a portion of its supply to public goods funding in some uh, set. I've been spending a significant fraction of my time in the last few years convincing a lot of groups to do this, to allocate a fraction of their um, monetary supply for their uh, economies to public goods funding, broadly defined. Sure, oriented towards your network and what's valuable to it, but broadly defined so you can spill over to a lot of other things. If we can do this right, like we get to rewrite kind of like how the world works. Just remember, these, these things are not static. A lot of people talk about economies and systems and governments as like um, the way things should be. Uh, in reality, all of these things and all of these structures and so on just were invented by people and were systems that got designed, deployed, and kind of worked and scaled. A lot of inventions didn't work, didn't scale, broke down or whatever. You know, the history is littered with inventions of human systems that didn't work. Um, you know, this, this part at the beginning that I talked about, you know, in terms of R&D funding, this didn't exist 100 years ago, right? Like, Governments didn't do this at all. Um, this looked like almost no basic research was happening. And so it's totally plausible that we can bridge this gap using crypto or you know, convincing governments or you know, financializing it so that investors could invest. Um, so that's just a few inventions away. VC didn't exist 50, 70 years ago. right? And so this entire part, part of the pipeline got built out in the last 70 years. So I want to like, maybe land some examples of the kinds of things that you should be like, looking at. Uh, Optimism's Retropy Jeff, super interesting mechanism. Um, not because it is, it is novel, but in fact because they made, made work a lot of things people were talking about before. So people have been trying to make the retrospective funding work for a while. Optimism, just find a really good way to scale it. Um, they just reward retro, retroactive impact. They've had a series of rounds. They're now funding every six months to the tune of like $100 million worth of value flowing to all the participants that contribute to that ecosystem retroactively after the fact, based on like community-oriented um, agreements of like what, what could be valuable. There's DRIPS, which is like funding you know, dependency flows in GitHub. You could do this for the publication graph. No one's stopping you today. You could like gra grab the entire publication graph, wire it up with money flowing through it. That's like a few months project. And like you could totally rewrite how capital works in science. Um, there's all kinds of other super interesting incentive structures. There's hypersetters which, which let you take impact and bottle it the same way that currency bottles utility, and then you can sell around impact. Um, think of it like a generalized carbon credit, but you can apply it for all kinds of um, all kinds of structures. You could take you know the funding staircase of VC that works really well. And by the way, VC is kind of a neural network. I won't go into that, but you know teaser. Um, funding staircases in the impact side, like a nonprofit. It are super lopsided. If we can make this kind of smooth like VC, all kinds of things would get drastically better. And again, if we can like financialize impact capital, that would be pretty, pretty good. Um, so I have a minute left, and maybe I'll finish with, we should make a crypto-powered ARPA, which I think would be like an extremely powerful, um, powerful thing. And um, yeah, come join in the public goods funding landscape, because that's super valuable. And for a lot of you who are working on like that first part of Web3, which is kind of securing the internet and establishing digital human rights. Super valuable, super important. I devote most of my time on that. Um, 
but this other stuff is like what I think, you know, 20 years out is probably going to have been more significant. And so we should like, you know, start spending some amount of your time in both, figure out how to use incentive structures to coordinate lots of people um, along the way, and so on. Uh, cool. I'll have like a few questions, and then I'll. I promised that I would make it interactive, and I didn't. Sorry about that. Uh, just a few questions, and then we'll go. All right. Any, any takers? Yeah. Uh, great question. So, um, uh, Falcon and Ethereum have been collaborating for, since you know before either existed, uh, uh, which is kind of a funny story. But um, we help. A, uh, Falcon already helps a lot of uh, Ethereum applications and so on. Um, data availability networks make a lot of sense around Falcon. So there's a set of us working on DA layer type stuff. Um, all of these chains are going to get highly integrated. Um, right now, they kind of feel like different islands. That's just a passing phase. Uh, we're going to get the calling conventions between these things like super nice, kind of like the internet. And so you'll be able to call from any contract to any other chain like really easily. Um, we're working on a one scalability tech uh, called IPC. That's one, one of the things I'm spending a significant fraction of my time on um, to just scale up um, how what blockchains can do. Uh, blockchains right now are like super rate limited. They're kind of like you know very very small throughput relative to the cloud. Um, if we do that scalability stuff right, then we can like help scale um, a lot of the Ethereum applications and so on. Yep. Yep. Great. Out of time. If you, uh, I'll stick around later at the break um, and happy to chat with more people. All right. Thanks.